and elderly characterized by hospitality. Have a heart that is warmed by good things, not sort of titillated by evil. An elder will have a heart so shaped by the Spirit of God that he delights in the things of God and the work of God and the people of God. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, and we're continuing a message we began last time, Leaders for a Complete Church. And Jonathan, sounds like part of what we're going to be taking a look at today is some of the characteristics, the qualities, and the heart to look for as a church decides who should be elevated into those leadership positions. Well, it's, I think, very tempting for us to look simply to gifts and abilities, to sparkling charisma and so on for for leaders, as we so often do in the world and in the institutions of the world. But the Bible is so clear with us that character matters a great deal, and character really matters more than gifting, actually, in church leaders. There are some gifts that are important, but character is is above all else, and that's a good lesson for us as we stand back and think about it. I think we see the logic of it and the importance of it, but we need to be reminded of it, and Paul does that for us in our passage today. Well, and so important that uh, we do is slow down and take a look at that because all we have to do is look at some of the current news headlines and we see this play out in front of us. So uh, glad that we are taking the time to take a look at Titus chapter 1 and continue our message called Leaders for a Complete Church. Here is Jonathan. The elder needs to be above reproach in family life. And then more generally, he needs to be above reproach in his character and behavior, verse 7. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. This idea that we've just spoken about of being a steward of God's household, that idea in itself tells us why the standard is set so high. Think again of this idea of the owner of a great estate, large house, beautiful house filled with precious belongings. There's land, there's staff, all the rest. This owner needs to find someone very, very special to take charge of the estate when he's away perhaps for some very long periods of time, business overseas. It's not a job that just anyone could do. The steward has got to be totally trustworthy. The owner needs to have complete confidence in him. Now think about the household of God, the church of God. Consider the value of that estate of that household, the cost of it. It wasn't a matter, was it, of the owner writing a big check or taking on a huge mortgage to to gain ownership of this estate. That wasn't the cost. No, what was the cost of this household? God sent his son, his only son, to die for the church, to rescue us, to redeem us, to shed his own blood for us, to make us his very own. And now the father entrusts this household to these stewards, to these elders. And he understandably sets a very, very high standard for them. Now, this is a challenging list of characteristics we find here in verses 7 and 8. And for us who serve as elders, it is hard, but I think healthy, to examine it. We look at it and we see areas where we need to grow, areas where we perhaps need to change, areas maybe where we need to repent. At the same time, Paul insists that it is a requirement for the role that an elder could not be justly reproached for a clear character failure in one of these areas. We're all flawed. We're all sinful. All works in progress. Of course we are. But the elder's life must not be characterized by a pattern of ungodliness in one of these areas for which he's open then to reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. Spiritual leadership is servant leadership. It's collaborative leadership where elders learn from one another and from other saints in the church family. And an elder that is convinced that he is right and everyone else is wrong, it's my way or the highway, who is convinced that he has the inside track on theology or methodology, who is arrogant, such a leader is a liability, of course, in the church. 
being arrogant, it often goes with being quick-tempered, dealing with people who disagree or who, who won't get, get on board or who are slow to learn. It's frustrating to such a person, and there's a powerful reaction. There's emotional and relational and perhaps spiritual damage to those in the fallout zone, and it just won't do for the elder. No, the elder needs to be in control of his passion, steady, reliable, ready to respond to emergencies. And so actually then, being in slavery to, to alcohol, being a drunkard, that's not going to be a fit. We can see why Paul writes that there. It's a quick way, isn't it, to ruin the reputation of a church, to damage the ministry, to let down the saints. No, that can't be. He can't be violent. Perhaps that doesn't require a whole lot of explanation, but boy, is it important. And he can't be greedy for gain. You know, ministry probably isn't the wisest career choice for someone who's aiming to get rich. It's probably not the strategic or the clever move. But there are dangers of the elder using his position to misappropriate money from a ministry. It's happened before. We've heard the stories to manipulate people, to extract money from them, to monetize ministry in some way for personal enrichment. And if someone is greedy to get rich, the dangers are obvious. It won't do. Now, those are a whole lot of negatives, and we do well to pay heed to them. But now come the positive characteristics. Want, rather than wanting to kind of hoard riches for himself, the elder must be willing to open up his home to share what he has. He must be hospitable. And if someone just has a closed door and everything they have is just for them, no one has ever shared a meal with them or spent time with them or, or, or been to their home, if it's a closed door, you know, that's a little warning sign. Something may be out of balance there. An elder, an elder will be characterized by hospitality. He must be a lover of good, says Paul. That is, have a heart that is warmed by good things, not sort of titillated by evil, entertained by unseemly things, amused by unwholesome things. No, he li likes to talk about the good gifts of God and the joys of serving Him and of knowing Him. An elder will have a heart so shaped by the Spirit of God that he delights in the things of God and the work of God and the people of God. Be self-controlled, says Paul. He'll have some control over his tongue, not be careless in what he says, in the confidences that he divulges, in the words he chooses, not giving full vent all the time to his emotions or opinions. Be self-controlled in the use of his time, in work and rest and sleep and the balance there. Be self-controlled in his approach to food and pleasure, not given to excessive indulgence, not out of control. No, he will be marked by evidence of a growing Christ-like character of the Spirit's work. He will be upright, holy, and disciplined. And when he stumbles, and he will, we elders and pastors do, None of us can claim perfection in these things. Anyone who would claim perfection is not to be trusted. When he fails, he will have a spirit of repentance and a hunger to be the person God calls him to be. Now, that is the calling when it comes to the character of the elder. That's the standard. It's a high calling, isn't it? It's a tough standard. But not only must the elder have a godly character, he must also have biblical convictions. And that's our next point. Now, whenever seeking leaders in any context for any role, there's always a temptation to make trade-offs. And to be honest, that's often necessary. A person may have some gifts and not others, some strengths and some weaknesses. I mean, we get that. That's just the reality. But when it comes to eldership, we mustn't make the mistake of choosing between character and convictions. And that can happen all too easily, I think. You know, someone is really godly and delightful and, you know, so well-liked. Everyone looks overlooks the fact that he has some rather strange theological ideas that have been getting stranger over time. He isn't quite orthodox in some areas, but he's so nice, so outgoing, so effective. We just turn a blind eye to the theological oddities. Or a man who's so well-versed theologically, so strong in his Bible knowledge, we overlook the fact that he's just a bully, or he's on his third marriage, or he's evidently pretty greedy. And it happens, doesn't it? 
we see how it happens, but Paul won't let us do a kind of either or here. Choosing between character and conviction. That would be like choosing between two used cars on the lot. One has a great engine, but faulty brakes. Another has pretty functional brakes, but a misfiring engine. Well, it's not a trade-off you really want to engage in or consider. Both are pretty important. You kind of need them both. And so we add to character biblical conviction at this point, verse 9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. The elder needs to know the trustworthy word, God's word, as it has been taught by Paul and the other apostles. He needs to know it and be convinced of it in such a way that he will really hold to it. He needs not to sort of bend with every doctrinal breeze that blows through the church, not capitulate when every theological challenge comes along, and there are always new ideas, there are always new challenges to biblical truth, new heresies, frankly, that become popular enough in the wider Christian world and Christian media. But the godly elder will know the truth well enough to hold to it and not be moved. And here is, here is a purpose to this. It is middle of verse 9, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. You know, a core part of biblical eldership is teaching the Word. Some elders will do more of that than others, of course. The staff elders here, our pastors, do a lot, and the lay elders probably do a little bit less. But it is a requirement of all elders that they be able to teach the Word, capable of teaching the Word, capable of giving instruction in sound doctrine. And I'll tell you, if you end up with a group of elders who don't have doctrinal convictions or the ability to teach, you will end up with a group of pragmatic managers and not spiritual shepherds. That's what, that's what could happen. And with such a group, when the latest management trend comes along, you know, that doesn't really fit with biblical principles, well, those biblical principles will quickly be sidelined for the sake of church growth or of relevance or of popularity or of increasing the budget or whatever it is. But elders with doctrinal convictions will lead and will shepherd out of conviction. Added to that, the elder needs to have this doctrinal conviction in order, end of verse 9, to rebuke those who contradict sound doctrine. You know, it would be so nice, speaking personally, it would be so nice if the work of eldership was only a positive thing. You know, teach the Word, encourage the flock to know the truth and delight in the truth. Just put everything positively. But unfortunately, a negative ministry is necessary as well. Elders need to be able to spot error, to call it out, to reject it and contradict it. Now, doing so never makes one very popular. It's not, it's not a fun thing to do. It's not how to win friends and influence people. But it is actually a requirement of the job. It's going to be vitally important. And the elder has to have the willingness and the ability to carry out this uncomfortable and sometimes very unpopular responsibility. He has to be willing to have a ministry that's not only going to be positive, but negative as well when necessary. And of course, it's only going to be possible to identify and then call out error if the elders of the church actually know the truth actually know the Word, have a doctrinal and a theological compass set by the Scriptures. Now, it's worth pausing at this point to ask why it is that Paul feels it necessary to raise this point. It's worth actually zooming out just a little bit here to consider why it is that Paul feels the burden of all this at this particular moment, why he feels the urgency for this type of eldership at the church in Crete just now. I don't want to steal the thunder of next week's sermon, but just look ahead with me and notice why Paul has highlighted this need for this type of eldership. He gives us the reason, verse 10. Such elders are going to be needed. Elders of the type we've just said. They're going to be needed for because there are many who are insubordinate empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. 
One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. What's going on? What's the issue? What is the crisis? It's always worth remembering that the New Testament letters are written into real-life situations. Often they are written into real-life crises. They're often crisis literature. They come alive to us, actually, as readers now. They come alive when we get hold of the issue that Paul was dealing with, the crisis he was addressing. And often what we discover is that the crisis of old is not unlike some of the crises we face today. Well, what was happening in Crete? There was a toxic culture. We spoke about that last time. Lying, evil, laziness, gluttony. Those things apparently were quite normal in Crete. And, and the church, it needed to be shepherded in a very, very different direction from the culture. It needed to be led to be countercultural. And so here's what was needed. The elders needed themselves to be unlike the culture all around them, hence all the character stuff. And even more concerning, false teachers from the circumcision party, false teachers, verse 10, who were pushing a line that said believers needed to be circumcised to be saved. We see this elsewhere in the New Testament. False teachers were coming along and teaching bad doctrine. And they were corrupt people. They were teaching it for, verse 11, shameful gain. And now we realize why Paul was emphasizing that the elders mustn't be about that. They were trying to make a quick buck peddling lies. And what's the solution? What's the solution when representative of the cults come knocking at the doors of the congregation, when health and wealth, prosperity preachers are coming into the living rooms of the saints on their TVs demanding donations from them, when the false teacher's podcast is getting some traction in the church family because it sounds so smooth? What's the solution? What's Paul's strategy? You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called Leaders for a Complete Church. Now, we're going to get back to the message in just a moment, so I hope you'll stay with us. Well, this message is part of a larger series. It's called Transformed by Truth. And if you miss any broadcast in the series, you can always listen through the new Encounter the Truth app. You can find the app at your favorite app store, and it makes it really convenient for you to listen to Jonathan's teaching whenever it fits your schedule. Again, just simply head to your favorite app store and look for Encounter the Truth, and uh, you can get it right there. You can also get Jonathan's teaching through our website, and you're going to find that by going to EncounterTheTruth.org. You can stream the programs or download MP3s for free. Again, our website address, EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, if you have just joined us, we're in the book of Titus. We're in chapter 1, looking at verses 5 to 9 today. So let's get back to the message. Again, here is Jonathan. What's the solution? What's Paul's strategy? Well, his strategy is this, elders. Elders of character and of conviction. And isn't that interesting? It all comes down to leadership. In the church, it all comes down to eldership. Friends, I think we're seeing here that the church of Jesus Christ stands or falls on the quality of its eldership. Now, as an elder myself, I say that with some trepidation, but I know it's true. What are we to do with this? I think we all see the priority in the text here, but, but what are we to do? What are the implications for us? What do we take away from this time together? Well, let me suggest a few key applications for us to take away, and we'll close with these. First, for us elders, and there are many of us, Let's commit ourselves to undertaking a personal spiritual health check here. Let's check our character and let's check our convictions. Do we live up to the portrait of godly character set out here? Are there, are there areas maybe where we've slipped actually, where we need to refocus, even repent with the help of the Spirit of God? Are we grounded in God's Word? Are we growing in our knowledge of the Word? Are we taking opportunities to teach the Word? Are we attuned to the possibility of error? And are we ready to call out error when we see it, even if it'll make us unpopular? Let's take an opportunity to examine those things today and the days ahead, to examine our own heart and life. 
Second, can we as a whole church family commit to pray for our elders? A number of people come to me from time to time and say, I pray regularly for you. We, we pray for you every day. We pray for you once a week. And those things are precious to me, those comments, because I know how much I need the prayers of the people of God. Paul has reminded us here how much eldership matters. How high is the calling of biblical eldership? How challenging it is. Could I ask you, please, pray for the elders of the church, the lay elders, the staff elders, the pastors. I'm so thankful for the elders God has given us, men who take this calling seriously, who are striving daily to be worthy of it with the help of the Spirit of God. Would you please pray for your elders that God would uphold us, uphold them, keep us true to this calling? Third, would you pray that God would raise up elders of this kind? One of the greatest challenges we face at the present time is the short supply of men of character and conviction who can serve as staff pastors and lay elders. We have needs here, urgent needs actually for both. And over the years, I have been sobered and sometimes discouraged by the sheer challenge of finding people who meet the qualifications. Would you pray that the Lord would raise up such people now and in the years ahead. It is the church's greatest need. Fourth, if you are a young man who aspires to eldership, and that's a good aspiration, the Scriptures tell us, can I encourage you and challenge you to use this framework, the framework set out here by Paul, godly character, biblical conviction, as your framework now for personal development. Maybe ask someone who serves as an elder now to mentor you, to speak into your life, to prayerfully coach you. How would you need to grow to meet these qualifications? Why not make that your ambition, your prayerful aim? The household of God is precious to Him. It is bought with the very blood of Christ. A toxic culture threatens the church from without. False teachers sometimes threaten the church from within. What is God's strategy for the protection of the church, for its care and for its nurture? It is elders of character and conviction. May God uphold our elders and may he raise up more of this kind for the years to come, for the generations to come. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth, wrapping up our message, Leaders for a Complete Church, really reminding us that the church is not complete until godly leaders have been put in place. Well, maybe you want to go back and listen to this message again. You can always do that by coming to our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, at Encounter the Truth, we're completely listener-supported, and that's what it sounds like. We depend on your generosity to keep Jonathan's teaching on this station, but as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to say thank you by sending you a book called How Church Can Change Your Life. And Jonathan, one of the things that I think is interesting about this book is that uh, the author, Josh Moody, he actually is tackling questions in this book, questions that uh, you know we may have asked or we may have uh, friends or family members who may have asked these questions? Well, I think there will be many who ask, really, why church is important? Do I need to go there at all? There are, there are plenty of folk who, you know, at least for a season, attempt to live the Christian life apart from the local church, apart from attending church, apart from being part of a local church. And really, Josh is, is tackling the question, why does church matter? And what does it do? And, and, and what's important about the local church? And I think if you've got someone in your life who maybe is, is not involved in church, maybe you yourself are not going to church at the moment, I think this book will be a really stimulating read and an encouragement to see the importance of the local church for anyone who would follow Jesus. Well, we'd love to send you a copy as our way of saying thanks for your financial support this month, a gift of any amount, and we want to send you How Church Can Change Your Life. You can find out more or give online by coming to EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 833-99-TRUTH. Again, our website, EncounterTheTruth.org or the phone number is 833-998-7884. Well, thanks for listening today. 
and I hope you'll join us next time.